Well, thank you. So now you move my talk. You give all the answers. Well, this one was uh, named down to the bed by Al Mullen. And he wrote a book on the Anglican. And I was a friend of mine. I, I miss him greatly because we just had some terrible fights about, about the Anglican. And uh, because it was thought that the farm was actually leased by John Brunner from a widow who lived in town. But uh, all the bad flags of the Anglican system is Guinness. So please uh, refrain from using that invented name. Because one of the other videos so always went on it. What a big fun it is to come to the Chicago Roundtable again. First time I spoke to the Chicago Roundtable was in uh, 1990, of all things. You know how long ago that is? I mean, uh, I couldn't have been that long. But we have always had a very really good relationship with the Rocky uh, Roundtable since its regards, as usual. And we know we work very closely on speakers together. And we really have, uh, I think, two best roundtables in the country. As an anti argues with that, but I don't think that I need to take up that, that argument. So, we're going to talk about the item today today. <coughs> Kurt, how did you see that? Kurt and I were together on a couple projects, didn't we? Yes, we did. Okay. Then we're going to talk about the, the item today that I want to do. And like I said, it took all the best stuff <coughs> in, a, in a minute. Um, the end of the day, of course, you get the first line. It was made up of the 2nd, 6th, and 7th Wisconsin when it was formed in October of 1861 in the Washington camps around Washington. And it was commanded by Rufus King. It was a Rufus King High School in Milwaukee that nobody knows who he is. And he's famous. He's a West Point graduate working in Wisconsin at the time from New York State. Uh, interesting man. Uh, and he's my favorite because he played in the first three organized baseball teams in all of Wisconsin history <laughs> on the grounds of what is now Marquette University. He was joined by the 24th Mission after the Battle of Antietam in November of 1862, another uh, Western unit. Uh, Western they were called the Feather Reds by the other soldiers because they said they brought everything from home, including their Feather Reds. <laughs> And it was a very dramatic rivalry. So we're going to talk about a topic that I keep stumbling across in my research, and that is the, the fact that um, important music was to the soldier there. And it was kind of a little bit of a book, I think, because I really only deal with, uh, with those five regiments. Uh, but I think it was kind of symptomatic, or at least a, a peek into the culture of the time. Uh, during the, the war and after, the, the music was uh, was always at hand at reunions and some were by different groups and kind of the culture, personal culture of the, of the war. And then he got involved in those days when he was in the army on the march and it would bring back memories of soldiers singing as they comes moved through the countryside or dance played. Sometimes the songs were Songs we're familiar with, it's like the song by John Young's Bottle, Why Is It Only in the Grave? And other times, uh, we have scandalous songs that we can't sing in polite society today, like the young woman who suddenly had a baby with red hair and caused a great scandal. And the soldiers would sing that song and laugh and laugh and laugh. It was a great way to pass the time. The brass bands. Which uh, played away from home songs were performing in morning uh, formations and afternoon formations. And they played during the inspections and reviews. And we gave another slide. And we sometimes forget how important music was to the Civil War soldiers. And we, because we, we, we forget that the music was an important part of the culture of the Civil War, there was singing societies, band concerts. And Cheap music that sold in great numbers, and all of those things were on there. Uh, many homes had pianos, uh, musical instruments inside, and the music for the soldiers, of course, all passed the time. And it would entertain, comfort them in their camps, brought back memories of home, family, strengthened the bonds among the comrades, and helped form new ones. 
Give me another slide. This one shows where the bands are. The bands played with those back horns because they, when they marched, they were at the head of the column and the horns were over the shoulders so the soldiers could actually actually see them. And any, any regulations uh, in the early days of the war uh, allowed for the regiment to have a band of 24 musicians. And they, uh, in addition, each of the 10 companies was authorized, each of the 10 companies in the regiment was authorized to Musicians and drum and a fifer, and they would be gathered together in a drum corps that was led by a drum major. So you give me a, a slide on the top. Okay, give me another one for that. Thank you. This is the drum corps of the 93rd New York Infantry. And this is another drum corps. I think this is an Indiana drum corps. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is the drum. Drum major was a 93rd New York. He says a certain style. He? <laughs> <laughs> he does just a certain style. Yeah. And finally, I give you one more. This is a oh, that's cruise from the 21st Wisconsin. I did a great kick out of uh, It's uh, this is the Western Roman, obviously not an army of the soldier, as you can tell by his car. Oh, that's my grandson. <laughs> <coughs> he drums for the second Wisconsin, plays the double tattoo for the second Wisconsin reenactment. And he, uh, <laughs> he's actually, he drums for a high school uh, band right now. So, we had this collection of musicians that played uh, while we were in camp and other times. So the second Wisconsin, the first regiment that fought at the Battle of Fort Wayne, as we're born today. But I uh, came in from Milwaukee, you know, I got to Washington before the Battle of Milwaukee. And we had a little band that they thought was the famous Milwaukee Silver Cornet Band, one of the best bands in the Army. And in fact, that, uh, it played all through the, through the war, very distinguished, and they said they were the best band in the Army at the time. the 7th Wisconsin came in with a pretty good band that they had put together in the south part of the state, because most of the company were on that area. Nineteen in Indiana had a pretty good band. But it was the sixth Wisconsin Infantry Band that created the most excitement. Without a doubt, without a doubt, it was regarded as the worst band in World War III history. <laughs> the absolute worst band in World War III history. Give me a slide. And it's this guy's fault. That's Colonel Isaiah Cup in Milwaukee. And he was torn with. <laughs> and every time he had a soldier that was awkward or didn't fit his profile, he would put him in the band. So the band was the worst possible band. And played so slowly that a German with a good ear for music broke the leg trying to keep time. She had to keep one, one foot in the air waiting for the next week. <laughs> They, they knew one would a song. The village clicks them. And they play the old and old. This horrible band was the worst band laughed at by the other regiments. Pointed to. They couldn't play by the quartermaster's tent because the quartermaster complained they were spoiling the meat. <laughs> so it, it got so bad. That when, when a soldier made a long turn in the war field, the whole regiment would be getting called put him in the band. Put him in the band. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that really came this terrible day. A terrible day in November of 1861. George Brittany called and decided to hold a grand review of his new army at Bailey's College <coughs> outside of Washington. So they cleared five miles of acres of land. The march on all the legends, 63 regiments and something like 40 batteries of artillery and cavalry gathered for this grand review. And you know how they work. You march past the reviewing stand, you pay out play, and the young officers of the 6th Wisconsin went to war with them. What do we need to do? We've got the worst band in the army. We'll be humiliated. We're passing the reviewing stand. So they talked me into the night. And argued and came up with a plan. 
Because if they had the worst band in the Civil War armies, they had the best drum major, a man named William Whaley from Prairie Machine, Wisconsin. Six foot five. Well, uh, that's not him. <laughs> six, we had him in a picture. Six foot five. Straight as an arrow. And they said when he marched, his drum corps, his legs, he was so high that people think he was defying gravity to get so far back with his nose in the air. So they came up with a plan. It's a new Western plan. It's a plan I'm sure you would agree with. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to put Lee Whaley in his drum corps at the front of the regiments. And we're going to march the band right behind the regiment, but not playing. And no way his eyes will be taken on Lee Whaley. And you know what? They won't even know uh -huh. that our band was the band. Now that's a good plan. Because I'm not sure I'm too good to reason that. I don't see this. I don't see this. I don't see this. I don't see this. That's a good plan, I think. So the main day came. Beautiful day. Perfect to, to march. To march along. And, and uh, all of the, the regiments were in perfect ship condition. Tuned up, shined up. And in a big crowd, three, four thousand people gathered on the side of the hill to watch the review of the troops move by. Every pretty girl from three states was there watching the soldiers, and every soldier knew it. So the band started to play, and they began to pass through the new stand. <coughs> and up comes the second Wisconsin band, the silver clarinet band of Milwaukee, never better. And they played really and more as they swept past the new stand, and the cloud docked his head. Good sentiment, true. Perfect. Aligned in step. Thank you for the answer. And out came the sixth regiment of Wisconsin. I don't know if I can tell this story. I was cautioned last night not to tell the story to the Chicago Round Table because it reflects so badly on the poor Wisconsin soldiers. We don't really. Puffed up by the honor of leading the regiment. And he's been back in the woods practicing a special maneuver just for the occasion. So as they came up to the room, see a comment sees Whaley. Doffs his hat, says, Look at that boy soldier. Doesn't he have a fine step? And Whaley begins to lean back. And he starts to spin with his baton faster and faster and faster. <laughs> And right in front of her, he would stand. He throws it into the air, up and higher, and the crowd was all higher and higher and higher, and wheeling. And the baton begins to come down faster and faster and faster. And wheeling grabs from the baton. I can't go on. <laughs> You know, the other officers look through the band, and when they see William Whaley on his hands and knees, when they gather in the bus, bouncing with Tom, looking for the club. And the pretty girl from Three States, there was this, this, this cry from the crowd of anguish. And the band, the band seen the disaster that has befallen the regiment. Strikes up the village quick step. <laughs> <sighs> One soldier says, oh, Our lines past your doing stand as crooked as the dogs being like stumbling and kicking each other. And when the seventh Wisconsin, there was laughter and slivers, those rascals from the second. Put it on. So they had to march back to Washington to their Washington camps. Mm -hmm. It was just a horrible, horrible time. And they, they had a great singer, a guy named John Tickner, who was a mail carrier from Juneau County, Wisconsin. He had this great voice. And he began to sing John Brown's Body. And the regiment would join in with the chorus. And Lincoln and Mrs. Lincoln passed in carriage, and the president doffed his hat. John Tickner's fine singing place. And in that crowd was a woman named Julia Ward Howe. 
And she heard the singing of the song and thought how coarse they were to such a beautiful young So that night, unable to sleep, she began to pen the words for the battle hymn for the republic. So the Wisconsin boys always argued that they at least helped small chorus that made that song possible. And Julie wrote how, said many years later, it was a Vermont regiment that you heard sing. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you think I'm going to tell you it was a Vermont regiment, <laughs> as a true son of Wisconsin. Anyway, so that was all part of it. The dance left, it was, it was, it was changed immediately after that. Uh, the regimental bands were broken up and they created a brigade band, one single band for all of the regiments. So the Iron Brigade Band was really made up of members of the Milwaukee Silver Coronet Band, which was hired to guard all through the war. In those days, of course, the soldiers sang in groups of either one at night, and much of the time they did their soldier life, they actually uh, entertained themselves with their concerts from themselves. And all we know of the role of music in the Iron Brigade is due to this man, Lloyd Harris of the Sixers Council. Long after the war, he wrote a series of memoirs, light hearted sketches of marches and camp life for the music of those days. And a friend said that he was not only genial, but he was patriotic and kindly. Harris was eight for being weak in Wisconsin from New York State. By the time he was 19, he was working as an express agent in the Mississippi River community of Prairie Machine. He listed as a private, quickly was promoted to sergeant, and uh, soon to second lieutenant. One of his comrades remembered that before we promoted, Harris had somewhat of a reputation for his singing and his songs. He played a lot of it, apparently with some, some expertise. He created a quartet of singers in the 6th Wisconsin Regiment. Uh, about, they were all young, brave, and handsome, the soldiers said. And it was during a long period of winter of 1861-62 that Harris's uh, quartet our singing class played and beat back the waves of homesickness that came along. One of those singers was the like captain of the Air Bomb, who would fall of Antietam, leaving a wife and young children. Two others were Laura Chapman and John Tickner, uh, one of the men who was killed at Gettysburg in the middle of the war. And it was Brown, they remembered, it was cold in the nights, so we call the happy voice. Let's sing Benny Haven's Hole, that famous drinking song of the West Point. And how they enjoyed singing that song at night, and how the listeners enjoyed hearing it. But then, after Antigua, after Brown fell, somebody would say, well, let's sing Benny Haven's Hole. And the quartet would refuse to, to sing it because the memories were too harsh. On the long march, when the band ceased to play, a chorus of voices would lift in the ranks. The prayer and machine men like to sing, well, never mind the weather, but get over double trouble for we're all bound for the happy land of the kingdom. And then the junior company boys would say, my name is Joe Bauer, I have a brother Ike. I came from Old Missouri, just all the way from Pike. And they would laugh at that, and after several chorus, somebody would sing that song about Sally Hellaby and the baby had red hair. And they heard a roar of laughter in the column. Then the Irish skull carvers of the Sixth Wisconsin who join in. Here is the health to Martin Hennigan's aunt. I'll tell you the reason why. She eats because she's hungry and she drinks because she's dry. <laughs> but it was the, they said the Germans, who had many uh, societies, singing societies, were often famous. And Harris said he would walk over in the night and listen to the Germans singing around their campfires. And one of the songs that they liked to sing. There's a beautiful flower called the forget me not I'll lay it on your heart and think of me. And in the, in the less respectful tone, they would sing this one. The Pope, he needs a married wife. He wants no care or married life. <laughs> and it was Harris who listed the songs of popular at the time. Uh, John Brown Bonnie, obviously, the Sweet Mind of the Tramp Tramp Tramp, the Rebel on the Flags, and they said they could hear the Rebel bands play songs like Honey Blue's Wag, Dixie, My Marilyn, and Stonewall Jackson's Way. And these are some songs I, have, I hadn't heard before. Wackensack, Tramp, 
Bert Packing in Cincinnati. I was the advisor at the time. Uh, but my theory was all, you know, Sally in her alley. I wonder if that's our dog. <laughs> and held the Wabash. So they sang in the camps, and sometimes the contrabands, it wasn't a circle, and one of the slaves were called contrabands of war that came uh, to work for soldiers in the camps for money and for food. And uh, on occasion, they would, would, uh, would join them the same. And as one of the listeners of uh, the former one of the slaves said he had a song that was a favorite of his master. And so when somebody said, Well, sing it. He said, I wrote my brother with ball the bed and shoot over the and when you have <laughs> and all of the soldiers got very indignant and threatened. They would shoot my the king back to, to where he came from. He was guilty of truth. Well, the poor fellow begged for another chance. And then for the boy, and then he sang this verse I wrote my gun with a bell in the and shoot Jeff Davis in the head. <laughs> and after all that, we had applause. They never forgot the fact the fine man that came with the 24th mission to make the war from Detroit and Wayne County in 1962 at Fredericksburg, there on the far left of the line. We have a band within a, in a dense cloud, playing a dense cloud of fall, playing a song, they're playing Yale Columbia, a happy man. When the sun broke through and winds carried the fog away, and the Confederate batteries opened up on them. One of the first guys ran in the midst of the band, scattering them right and left, and they made for the sheltering bank of the river. They tell them the story of they say, You never saw the 24th Michigan band in the in front of the battle ever again. Harris, in his company seed, writes from Crawford County, embarked on the march to Gettysburg, the Sunday before Gettysburg, uh, were on a picket line near Frederick, Maryland, and they found a farm in New York. So the soldiers manhandled the working out onto the porch, and then with a very soon, they joined the farm with his wife and two daughters, and they sang hymns for a half hour. This changed a lot these days, hasn't it? And of course, in the Battle of Gettysburg, the Western men, uh, the drone corps, the six Wisconsin played the camels are coming as they rushed to the, to towards Gettysburg. And when the other regiments attacked McPherson's Ridge, they played the back of the regiment, the brigade band, was playing Hail Columbia. You need to know this. This is the only known photograph of the Iron Brigade band in entirety. It was taken all, by all the chances to have a battlefield at Gettysburg before Lincoln spoke for the cemetery. They were there working as, as, as hospital attendants and other things. Uh, from the battle on to the to the back of the battle when they can talk. Uh, it was a photo taken by the Tipton brothers in uh, the attire for his new days. And unfortunately, we don't know much about this photograph because the record reported in the fire. This is an individual photo of, uh, of one of the, the bands, and, and it, uh, it showing basically. Uh, what kind of uniform they wore. It's not quite the typical anchor they uniform, but it is the long the musician's coat and the, and the black hat. And during the days after Gettysburg, there was one white song that was played, and it was the work of the White Harris. He contacted a composer in Milwaukee and he asked if he would write a special piece of music for the other day, and the guy, a man named H.N. Hempstead, uh, said that he would do it. He was famous for writing the Milwaukee Light Guard Quick Step. He said he would do it if there were subscriptions for 300 copies at 50 cents each. So soon, the money was collected to send it to the and it came back to 298 copies on the way on Marsh near the Rapidan River. The copies were distributed. They had no way to, no uh, envelopes or anything to send them home. So they tacked them all together in different ways. They made their way back to Wisconsin and made out of Michigan. But Harris had to admit, he said, the music was not so pleasing to the ear as the light car, except, but its name was so good. This is what the sheet music looked like. It shows those of various officers of the different regiments at the time. Here's the blue quick step. You got a pet by that, don't you? You have a chance to find the sheet music. So, the 
Aaron, but music plays an important role. And then also, even poor soldiers have higher mobility bands. You can imagine that. But much of the, you know, much of the music of the Army of the Potomac faded after days before the one slow outside of Petersburg at the, at the crater. They had a, had a truce after two days to bury dead and black guys to the moon. And that late afternoon, when the opposite Confederate lines appeared where all the citizens of Petersburg came up to look at those damn Yankees on the other side. And one of the old bands struck up Dixie. And on the Union side, they quickly answered with rally on the flag, and then the bands do for the good part of an hour playing back and forth. And as dusk settled on that old battlefield, and the family began to return home, the Confederate band picked up and played a favorite song and was soon joined by all the Union bands on the street. Music was not there when the original bands were gone. The day bands, many of the singers were dead, gone by 64. The army was moving every day. The war was taking on a hard edge, and the soldiers were stripped down for hard fighting. No pleasant winter caps in those days, and all the long, quiet times not marked by fighting. For the truth of the matter is, the music had been all but beaten out of the army brigade by the rest of the army by 1865. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I'll answer only two. Okay. And they have to be easy. Yeah. I, let me just make a comment. I think that the, the whole world of Civil War music is, is overlooked. And we have all sorts of bands and we buy a lot of records and, and talk and like that. But they really, no one has really made a real serious uh, scholarly study of how important music was to, to those soldiers and how those songs lasted. They still carry emotional people today. Let me just my comment on the head, I'll take your question. Uh, you know, nowadays we put these earphones on and we have all these electronic devices, but in those days they really don't need their own music in a lot of cases. And it was a, it was a, a simple to it in some places. Even that scandalous song, Sally had a baby and she had her hair. Where do you find uh, actual performances of some of the music from the Civil War? Where's the best place to look? Uh, there's a band in Wisconsin called the First Brigade Band. They play all the original Civil War instruments. There's original copies of the original Civil War music. So they get a very authentic sound that you just don't get anywhere else. And they play all of those concerts. They played at the in Longwood in Washington a couple of times. They can, they, you can catch them around. If you go on the internet, you can look them up with the first day they have been the named after a band that followed Sherman in the Marsh of the And one of the best songs is Marching Through Georgia, which played in the Midwestern style uh, and manner that gets a lot of attention. They were playing in the Winchester, Virginia, in a concert for a reenactment group of the and after the third version of Marshall Street Georgia, some southern came up and tapped the band. He said, You really don't want to do that song again. <laughs> so we have trouble. Pretty good band is good. Uh, you they have CDs that get great to me. There's a lot of pretty good bands. Uh, uh, you can find, you can poke around in the, in the music and, and dig them out. But I enjoy the, I, I, you get a sound with those old horns that you just don't get anywhere else. And I don't know why, maybe it's my sentimental value. But they're good to see you. get a chance. They have a, 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 a house that they occupy and they play and practice in the other town of Wisconsin. But they're all over. They have their band schedule. Um, and they probably, I'm sure they play in some way. The theme group, uh, they sing all the good songs, the songs in the, in the old fashions, songs that you don't hear very often. Uh, and they really catch the music. Oh, I think my band is very, very expensive. They also have a certain routine that they like to do. They don't like to vary the program. Yeah. It's, you know, the band, you know, the, the knock on the you know, first grade band is it's too professional. You know, it's well organized and, and, and nicely done and it's very entertaining. There are another, uh, you see the ends of some of the reenactments, some of the middle of the regimental bands. These are small groups of 
of soldiers with advanced players. They always have to do who repeat, and I'm not the second who repeats. What's wrong with who repeats? You always have to do who It's like nice, nice models of beer on the wall. Yeah, I, I agree. There's a, there's a camera of songs that they play that they, they move over and over again. And it's, it's interesting when they play, uh, when they, when they play different songs. But that's the other thing I was like, 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 I was uh, so they, uh, so it's fun to listen to him because he's got a little group of, they got a big bass drum, a couple of ones, with two, two fighters, and they play out. Uh, we forget, I mean, in the early days of the Civil War, especially the infantry regiments, the drum was the command thing that called them together, called them for meals, called them for uh, different calls, that were, and they, they recognized their own drummers, which was interesting. Also. You see that a question on that? Yeah, I was wondering about the uh, band equipment. Uh, did the bands come and bring their horns and everything else with them? The silver cornet, the silver cornet that bands did, but the rest of them were issued by the quartermaster department. There's a story they tell, kind of, Boy Harris tells that they, the regiment was coming back over and they found a stack of horns by the side of the road. And so they had the bright idea that they would play a serenade for Colonel Cutler. So they went down in front of a couple's tent and they called them on and they played, you know, they didn't know how to play the instruments, they just two of them, but Cutler didn't know the difference. <laughs> and so he went back into his tent, came out with a bottle, gave everybody a drink. <laughs> they thought that was bigger than enough. Okay. Did uh, musicians participate in battles? Yeah, I, I, I should have touched it on that. They were not playing, they were supposed to act as little workers and things like that, and they act as hospital stewards and, and things different things like that. Uh, and that's what happened to the brigade band at Gat after days, but they played a key role in the hospital team and all of that. And they probably played that week as Gettysburg Regress as one of them. One of those guys I had a photograph was a Gettysburg made up with joined the army ship and went to the band room uh, and uh, came back to Wisconsin. So it's a it's a it's a good story. I wish we had more information on the Iron Brigade band. It was a guy in Georgia who's got one of the problems identified with the Iron Brigade, not an issue from a, a civilian brass drum that somebody had brought with them to the world. But there's not much. Like I said, it needs a, some kind of scholar to really look at the whole of uh, the music they all took why it lasted. But I still think that even Hugh Peace has a ring to it sometimes, right? Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I don't disagree with that. It's, and it's, you know, I don't want to be confused about this. This is a whole civil war experience. <laughs> so it's great fun. As long as they, as long as they play the battle plan for you. Yes, the battle plan for you. You know, historically, what, why were kids always chosen to be drummers? Or the world where it's the prevalence? Well, I mean, it's the drummers. It's the drummers. In many cases, uh, you know, you saw that one regular looking soldier in the 21st Wisconsin. Um, what happened was, is usually children wanted to go with their fathers or uncles to go to war, but they were too young to carry a musket, so they, they made them drummers just so they could be in the, with them and be the kids, you know, learn to, to play their instruments. And, uh, and, and so many of the, the young musicians you see are probably relatives of somebody in the regiment. We had women used to go with the Civil War regiments too. The daughters of the regiment we slept in separate tents and we lived in. And that was, I mean, that was all part of that. It's hard to, to, to recognize how families were brought right up to the front of the war. Lived in settlements near the front lines of the war. Husbands were colonels of the war. So that's interesting. Yes? Well, I think the comment about drummer boys was perhaps also partly occasioned by the seen in the John Wayne movie, The Horse Soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> and Hoover Pease was one of the first Civil War songs that I learned how to sing. <laughs> Thanks to an album that you found in grocery stores called Songs of the Civil War, featuring Smith Brothers. That was when you Hoover Pease. Yeah. Like I said, it's a very popular song, and the soldiers like to sing it. At the uh, 1982 reunion, uh, Lloyd Harris' son and three Sons of the records, one of the other singers, 
And so I mean, that's when they, uh, they said uh, that was Double Lake, Wisconsin, at the resort. And they said that was with Dry Island. And I suspect if we brought those four boys in to sing for us tonight, they would be the Dry Island House. <coughs> they would all be very kind listening to my stories of the other day. And I really didn't explain uh, Sally and the baby with my heart. <laughs> Maybe someday I'll be able to share the words with you. Thank you very much.